If you're looking to get a new car, you could really cut expenses by bundling your car and renter's insurance with Progressive. Sure, you love your old car, but you know it's not normal to give instructions on how to open the window. It should be self-explanatory, but it's not. And notice how when you're in other people's cars, you can feel cushion in the seats? That's pretty nice, right? No, it's just normal. So bundle your renters and car insurance with Progressive and put the savings toward a new car. It's time. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. If you believe in omens, there were plenty of psychic warnings for Lynyrd Skynyrd in October 1977. Their new album, Street Survivors, was certified gold and it ominously featured the song called That Smell. It had been written by Ronnie Van Zant and Alan Collins as a stern warning after bandmate Gary Rosington wrapped his brand new Ford Torino around a tree during an alcohol fueled joyride. Ronnie had a creepy feeling that life was about to take a dark turn for the band. The sense of impending doom for the band continued to linger in the air. On October the 18th, 1977, they boarded a plane from Lakeland to Greenville, and that would be their first brush with death. After a concert in Greenville, the following day on October 20th, 1977, the band had boarded a chartered flight for the next stop of their tour in Baton Rouge. At roughly 6.42pm, the plane ran out of fuel near the end of the flight and would crash into a remote forest a short distance from the Mississippi-Louisiana border. Six people would die that day, including lead singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Steve Gaines, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, pilot Walter McCreary and co-pilot William Gray. Join us on a supernatural journey as we tour the musical history of Ronnie Van Zant and Leonard Skinner. We investigate what happened leading up to the mysterious crash and reveal the deadly curse that would follow the band in the aftermath. This is Death by Misadventure. Jacksonville, Florida was a small city in the 1940s. Still shy of 200,000 people, it lay on the Atlantic Ocean just south of the Florida-Georgia border. Sleepy, hot, and a mix of middle class and poor, it was heavily Baptist and hella conservative. Lacey Van Zant was a blue-collar, God-fearing, hardcore, loud and proud Southerner. He earned his living driving an 18-wheeler. Lacey and his wife, Marion, lived on the rough edge of Jacksonville, known as Shantytown, where you learned to fight for what little you had. Together, the couple had six children, three girls named Darlene, Marlene, and Joanne, also three boys, Johnny, Donnie, and the oldest, Ronnie. Ronnie Van Zant was born on January 15, 1948, under the zodiac sign of Capricorn, at St. Vincent's Hospital in Jacksonville. He grew to be a short, scrappy kid who was the toughest on the block. Ronnie's home was located near a dirt racetrack, and the kids would wait outside the fence for tires to fly loose so they could sell them back to the hot rod drivers. Whoopings were common in the Van Zant home, and Lacey liked to tell a story about the time he got down on his knees to teach Ronnie how to box. The toddler, he claimed, gave him a black eye. Lacey was a pro boxer and was proud to teach his boys how to fight and learn how to inflict the greatest possible damage. While Ronnie loved and excelled at baseball and boxing, his dad gave him a deep love for fishing, a love that would stay with him during his short but memorable life. Lacey played a little guitar and liked country music. Merle Haggard and Conway Twitty rang from the radio in their modest one-story home on a daily basis. His disciplinary style may have bordered on abuse, but he raised his boys to have a solid work ethic and drove Ronnie's steel determination to become a rock star. In high school, Ronnie heard that one of his schoolmates was starting a band, 
Cocky as hell, when he showed up for the audition, he told the band point blank he was their new singer. No one dared to tell Ronnie no, so he elbowed his way into the new band named Us. Soon after that, Gary Rossington and Bob Burns joined the group and recruited other players, including guitarist Alan Collins, the southern rock band that would later become Leonard Skinnerd. The band went through several name changes, My Backyard, The Noble Five, before becoming The 1% in 1968. Still known as The 1% in 1969, Ronnie sought a new name for the band after growing tired of smart-ass comments from the audience that said the band had 1% talent. At Burns' suggestion, the group settled on Leonard Skinner as the new name for the group. It was a mocking tribute to their P.E. teacher at Robert E. Lee High School, who was notorious for strictly enforcing the school's policy against boys having long hair. In these formative years, Leonard Skinner rehearsed at whoever's family house could stand the volume. They eventually found a tin roof shack out in the sticks that they named the Hell House due to the oppressive heat and bugs from the nearby lake. Ronnie would make the band practice long hours, and the pain and sweat eventually paid off. They were offered a record deal in 1970, but Ronnie turned it down because it was with Capricorn Records, who Allman Brothers were signed to, and he didn't want the band to be on his competitor's label. However, Leonard Skinner continued to perform to packed shows throughout the South in the early 1970s, cultivating their unique blues rock sound. During this time, the band experienced some lineup changes and added a new member. In 1972, roadie Bill Powell became the band's keyboardist after Ronnie heard him playing a rocking rendition of Freebird. Soon, the band's patience and tenacity paid off when they were spotted in a club by Al Cooper, a record producer and founder of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Cooper was knocked out by what he heard and walked the band into MCA Records, and they were signed immediately. The band hit the studio, and Cooper was impressed by their professionalism, arrangements, guitar sound, and the southern rock style of lead singer Ronnie Van Zant. In Cooper's eyes, according to Classic Rock magazine, Leonard Skinner were his Allman brothers, and they were poised to be the next band to capture the southern rock crown. However, Leon Wilkinson, citing nervousness about fame, temporarily left the band during the early recording sessions for their first album, only playing on two tracks, and was replaced on bass by Ed King. The departure was short-lived, and Leon soon rejoined the band after the album's release at Ronnie's invitation, and they switched King to guitar. The self-titled debut album, featuring Free Bird, was released on August 13, 1973, and sold over one million copies. A few months later, the band hit the road and took the opening slot for the Who tour. The band's 1974 follow-up album, Second Helping, featured the hit single Sweet Home Alabama. The song was written by the band as an answer to two songs, Southern Man and Alabama by Neil Young, which dealt with themes of racism and slavery in the American South. However, the cracks were slowly starting to show inside the band, and fame took its toll on drummer Bob Burns. In January, he left the band after suffering a mental breakdown during a European tour. Burns, who'd been playing poorly and suffering Ronnie's wrath regularly, freaked and tossed the hotel's beloved resident cat out his fourth floor window, making for a grisly kitty splat outside the establishment's front door. He later went after the road manager with a pickaxe. Somehow, the band got through the two-week tour, but made a point of putting Burns on a separate flight home, and he was immediately replaced by Kentucky native and former U.S. Marine, Artemis Pyle. Ronnie, always the perfectionist, made his new drummer follow a precise routine. He had to do the same crashes and rolls at the same time every night, or he would get upset. The band's third album, Nothing Fancy, was recorded in 17 days but lacked the special magic of Leonard Skinner's two previous releases. Cooper, unhappy with the results, parted ways with the band by mutual agreement before its release. 
The original lineup continued to unravel, and midway through the Nothing Fancy tour, guitarist Ed King abruptly left the band after falling out with Ronnie after he belittled him in front of his bandmates. But the show must go on, and Leonard Skinner continued for the next several months with only two guitarists rather than their usual three-guitar army. The band would continue to make changes, and in January 1976, Ronnie added backup singers Leslie Hawkins, Cassie Gaines, and JoJo Billingsley, called The Honkettes. The band's fourth album, Give Me Back My Bullets, was released but did not achieve the same success as the previous albums. Ronnie and Alan felt the band was missing its signature sound without the three-guitar attack, and the search began. After auditioning several guitarists, backup singer Cassie Gaines recommended her younger brother Steve. He was invited to audition on stage with Leonard Skinner at a concert in Kansas City on May 11, 1976. Liking what they heard, the band jammed with him several more times before he joined the group in June. With Steve Gaines on board, they recorded the double live album, One More From The Road, at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. The band Leonard Skinner was a brotherhood and treated each other like family. They worked hard and they played hard. They shared a powerful karmic bond, and strangely, many of them had lost their father at a young age. Drummer Artemis Pyle's father died in a plane crash. Gary Rossington's father passed away shortly after he was born. Ed King's father committed suicide, and Leon Wilkinson's father was alive, but was considered strange by the other bandmates. Ed King claimed he was a mean little man with the personality of a thumb. However, Ronnie's dad, Lacey Van Zant, was loved by all of them and was considered a father figure to the band. As Leonard Skinner continued to climb the charts with hit songs like Free Bird and Sweet Home Alabama, the band only got rowdier. They became raging rock stars who snorted cocaine, wrecked hotel rooms, and crashed their cars. But Ronnie never forgot his blue-collar roots and made the guys rehearse several hours a day. Even when they were in concert, the band almost never improvised. Ronnie believed fans ought to get what they paid for, and they were on the road up to 300 days out of the year. He was Leonard Skinner's main songwriter and leader of the band, known as Papa Ronnie when sober. He was a thoughtful guy who held the band together through earlier, leaner times. However, when he was drunk, he became a violent and intimidating guy who knocked out the two front teeth of keyboard player Billy Powell and had even slashed the hands of Gary Rossington, his best friend and guitarist, with a broken beer bottle. The rock and roll lifestyle soon caught up with him, and by late 1976, Ronnie considered leaving the band. His health was suffering from nonstop touring, and he wanted to focus on being a husband and a father to his two little girls. But Gary and Alan convinced him not to leave and promised to tone down their hard partying ways. The new band rules, combined with the addition of Steve Gaines on guitar and co-vocals, infused new energy into the band and re-inspired Ronnie to write more songs. One song, That Smell, was written after Gary's car accident and brush with death. During that time, both Alan and Billy were also in car accidents in the space of six months. And Ronnie had a creepy feeling the tide was about to turn for Leonard Skinnerd, and he was inspired to write those morbid lyrics. But according to his father, Ronnie could always see the future and had the gift of second sight. He believed Ronnie knew his time on Earth was running out, and before the Survivor tour, he gave away his favorite black hat and a beautiful ring he used to wear to his uncle. Then Ronnie gave his father several things, including his lawnmower and his 1955 Chevy pickup truck. Also, an award he had won in Scotland, where he cryptically told the audience, I don't think I'll be back over to see you or play for you anymore because I have a feeling I won't live past the age of 30. Ronnie was 29 at the time. A few weeks later, on October 17, 1977, Leonard Skinner's new album, Street Survivors, was released to critical and popular acclaim. The band kicked off a new tour, and they were playing to sell out crowds. However, darkness would soon descend on the band like a thick fog. (laughs) 
If you believe in omens, there were plenty of warnings for the band Leonard Skinner in October 1977. Their new album, Street Survivors, was certified gold, and it featured the song called That Smell. Now they call you Prince Charming. Can't speak a word when you're full of ludes. Say you'll be all right come tomorrow, but tomorrow might not be here for you. Ooh, that smell. The smell of death surrounds you. The band's psychic warnings were compounded by the fact that Ronnie Van Zant, born with the life path number 11, had what his father called the second sight. Ronnie told family and friends he had a premonition he would die before the age of 30, and eerily, his birthday was only three months away. The sense of impending doom for the band continued to linger in the air. On October 18, 1977, they boarded a plane from Lakeland to Greenville and would have their first brush with death. During the trip, guitarist Alan Collins looked out the window and saw a 10-foot flame shoot out of the right engine of the chartered flight. Luckily, the plane would safely land and Leonard Skinner would play together one last time on October 19, 1977 in Greenville, South Carolina. The following day, they boarded the flight for the next stop of their tour. Alan Collins, still upset over the previous trip, refused to get on the plane. He had an uneasy feeling, but Ronnie insisted that they leave, saying, when it's your time, it's your time. Let's go, man. We've got a gig to do. Reluctantly, the rest of the band boarded the aircraft. The 10-foot flames seen shooting out of the right engine two days earlier had done little to inspire anyone's confidence. After Alan Collins boarded the plane, he continued to warn the band he felt something terrible was about to happen. Cassie Gaines, a member of the Honkettes and sister of guitarist Steve Gaines, was so petrified that she nearly squeezed into the band's cramped equipment truck until Ronnie convinced her to get on the plane also. The plane took off at 5.02 p.m. without incident. Once in the air, anxiety gave way to relief amongst the band Rolling Stone magazine wrote in 1977. In the back of the plane, a fiercely competitive game of poker had become heated and one of the players ripped the table out of the cabin wall. Usually, Ronnie would have joined them, but his chronic back pain forced him to lie down in the aisle of the plane. About an hour later, the right engine which had been sputtering throughout the flight, died completely. Despite having refueled in Greenville, the plane was dangerously low on gas. At 6.42 p.m., the pilot frantically radioed Houston Air Traffic Control Center, asking for permission to land. Before they could turn the plane around, the left engine also failed, and the plane began to drop quickly. Exactly how Ronnie Van Zandt spent his last few minutes alive is disputed. In his memoir, Jim Odin, his bodyguard, remembers waking him up and strapping him into a seat. However, Artemis Pyle remembers Ronnie walking to the back of the plane to retrieve a pillow. As he walked forward, he shook his hand, and they looked at each other and smiled. Artemis believed at that moment Ronnie knew he was going to die. Rhodey, Mark Frank, said the pilots made a frightening 180-degree turn. One minute he could hear the plane's engines roar, and the next moment it became dead quiet. The aircraft was now just a few hundred feet above the ground. The pilots were desperately looking for some open area to safely land the plane, because they were still eight miles from the nearest airport. They never found any, and they were forced to land in the middle of a Mississippi swamp. Upon impact, lead singer Ronnie Van Sant would die instantly of blunt force trauma to the head. Assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick was also killed on impact, along with guitarist Steve Gaines. But his sister Cassie lived a short time longer before succumbing to blood loss. The lifeless bodies of both pilots remained strapped in their cockpit seats, suspended upside down from a nearby tree. Billy Powell's nose had been nearly torn off his face after he crashed headfirst through a table. Ten feet above the carnage, Leslie Hawkins and Bill Sykes, a television crew that had accompanied the band, were alive but stuck in a tree. They waited, barely daring to breathe, 
until help could arrive. Three lone passengers, including Mark Frank, drummer Artemis Pyle, and sound engineer Ken Pedden, crawled out of a hole in the tail of the fuselage and went up to look for help. Artemis Pyle emerged from the wreck with several shattered ribs. But he was well enough to walk, and nothing was going to stop him from getting his bandmates help. He was a former Marine, and he believed it was his duty to leave no one behind. A few hours later, when Ronnie's wife was notified there had been a plane crash, she instantly knew her husband was dead. Judy Van Zant would later state in an interview, Ronnie told me so many times that he would die before he was 30. I realized that he really knew what he was talking about. Artemis Pyle dragged his body through the murky swamp, along with road crew members Kenneth and Mark, to get help. At one point, a helicopter circled overhead. The sound of the crash had alerted paramedics. But because the plane had run out of fuel, there was no fire to help them locate the survivors. It took the three injured bandmates 45 minutes to reach a farm owned by Johnny Moat. The farmer was putting out hay for his cattle, when he heard what sounded like a car skidding on gravel and a loud boom. When he saw the men soaked in blood with long hair and screaming, the farmer initially assumed that they were up to no good and fired a warning shot. Artemis and the two others hit the ground and they yelled they were just in a plane crash. Though initially skeptical, eventually Moat realized they were telling the truth and quickly mobilized his neighbors to head for the crash site. A neighbor of Johnny said, the first thing I saw was a bloody hand reaching out from the debris. Folks were all mashed together. We'd move one and there would be another one laying there. Volunteer fireman Jamie Wall reached the scene and began moving people out of the wreckage with a hatchet. News of the plane crash soon spread across the airwaves and before long an estimated 3,000 people had converged on the scene. According to Rolling Stone magazine, not all of them were good Samaritans. In the ensuing chaos, souvenir hunters took billfolds, jewelry, suitcases, banned merchandise, and even chunks of metal from the crash site. The medics took the dead, Ronnie Van Zant, Steve and Cassie Gaines, Dean Kilpatrick, and the two pilots to a temporary morgue at a local high school gymnasium. The rescue efforts were slow, and three planes were chartered to pick up the loved ones to identify the dead bodies. Among the heartbroken family members was Ronnie's father, Lacey Van Zant, who was accompanied by a family friend, 38 special guitarist Don Barnes. Ronnie's mother, Marion, who had developed a severe phobia of flying after witnessing a crash that killed nine people as a child, she declined to make the trip. After identifying Ronnie, his father put on a brave face to visit the others and decided against telling them that he had died in the crash. In fact, Ronnie's death was kept secret until the other gravely injured bandmates were well enough to hear the tragic news. What was especially eerie, Gary Rossington would later state in an interview that after the accident, on how Alan Collins and he were spooked but grateful their lives were spared. Gary would later reveal he had sat in the middle seat between Ronnie and Steve, who were killed instantly on impact, and Alan had sat in the middle seat between Dean and Casey, who both died in the fatal crash as well. The band's fifth album, Street Survivors, was released three days before the plane crash. Eerily, the album cover showed the band engulfed in flames. In the middle, ominously consumed by fire, was Steve Gaines, and next to him was Ronnie Van Zant. After the accident, the album was pulled from record stores, and the label re-released it with new artwork, showing the band against a plain black background. 
Street Survivors went on to become the band's second platinum album and reached number five on the U.S. album chart. The official cause of the plane crash was released in a statement. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was fuel exhaustion and total loss of power from both engines due to crew inattention to fuel supply. Contributing to the fuel exhaustion were inadequate flight planning and an engine malfunction of undetermined nature in the right engine, which resulted in higher than normal fuel consumption. Six people died in the fiery crash, including lead singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist and vocalist Steve Gaines, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, pilot Walter McCreary, and co-pilot William Gray. Most of the remaining survivors had been seated toward the back of the plane. Guitarist Albert Collins suffered a cracked neck vertebrae and a doctor recommend his arm to be amputated, but his father refused. Keyboardist Billy Paul received extensive facial lacerations and a broken right knee. Drummer Artemis Pyle suffered a broken sternum and several broken ribs. Rhythm guitarist Gary Rossington sustained a concussion and broke both of his legs and arms. Leon Wilkinson broke his jaw and had most of his teeth knocked out. He suffered a crushed chest with a punctured lung and sustained internal injuries. Leslie Hawkins suffered a concussion, broke her neck in three places, and had facial injuries which required plastic surgery. She was partially paralyzed and suffered permanent neurological damage from the accident. In an interview from the crash scene, Billy Paul recounts the harrowing details. Shortly before 6 o'clock Central Daylight Time, the pilot, Walter McCreary of Dallas, Texas, radios Houston Air Traffic Control. He's low on fuel and can't make Baton Rouge, 80 miles away. Instead, he'll try for a small airport at nearby Macomb, Mississippi. When we found out 10 minutes from the Baton Rouge airport that we ran out of gas, and uh, I just heard the pilot go, oh my God. Pilot McCreary turns his plane to the left and starts back toward Macomb. His altimeter reads 2,000 feet. The time is just past 6 o'clock. One of the engines on the Convair quits, probably starved for fuel. My wife and I were out sitting in our backyard, and we heard this plane come over. Which it sounded like it was running on one engine. And uh, then all of a sudden, I heard that engine go out. By now, Pilot McCreary is desperately looking for a spot for an emergency landing. He follows a pipeline route. For reasons unknown, McCreary changes his mind and heads for a better spot, a pasture off to his left. The Convair 240 is in a glide, a hundred yards short of the pasture. The wings are clipping treetops. The plane stalls and goes down. The Leonard Skinner band was riding high. They had just released a new album, Street Survivors, and set out on a five-month cross-country tour to promote it. They were on their way to a concert at Louisiana State University when disaster happened. We got to spiral down, trying to lose altitude, trying to face the land. And I thought he was going to make this field, and until the last minute, I saw that it wasn't. Started clipping pine trees. And at that point, I grabbed a blanket and braced myself, put the blanket over my face. All I saw was treetops. I looked out my window, I was in the middle of the airplane on the right wing. I tried to get close to the back of the airplane as possible. But I got in the middle of the airplane on the right wing, and um, all I saw was treetops. And at, at first it wasn't so bad, but then when it hit the, you know, the middle of the trees, it was horrible. Yeah, it was, it was an experience nobody wants to ever experience, never. A private ceremony was held for Ronnie Van Zant on October 25th. Among those who attended the funeral were his wife and family, and included Billy Powell, who was the only band member well enough to attend, along with former bandmates Ed King and Bob Burns. Other mourners included Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers, Charlie Daniels, and Al Cooper of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Charlie Daniels performed Amazing Grace and read the following poem. A brief candle 
both ends burning in an endless mile, a bust wheel turning, a friend to share a lonesome time, a handshake and a sip of wine, say it loud and let it ring, that we are all part of everything, the future, the present, and the past. Fly on, proud bird, you are free at last. Later that day, Ronnie Van Zant would be laid to rest next to his bandmates, Steve and Cassie Gaines. However, several years later, on June 29, 2000, vandals would break into the bandmate's tomb. Ronnie Van Zant's casket was pulled out and dropped on the ground. The bag containing Steve Gaines' remains was torn open and some scattered onto the grass. Ronnie would later be reburied at Riverside Memorial Park in Jacksonville, near the grave of his father, Lacey, and mother, Marion. Both his current resting place and the empty mausoleum in Orange Park are listed with the warning statement, due to the June 29, 2000 vandalization of his original grave site, his casket was moved to this new location and buried in a massive underground concrete burial vault. To open the vault would require a tractor with a lift capacity of several tons. It is also patrolled by security. In the aftermath, the surviving band members of Leonard Skinner continued to be haunted and eerily connected by the tragic history they shared. Ed King, who walked out on the band during the infamous 1975 torture tour on May 27th, was replaced by Steve Gaines, who died on the plane crash on October 20th, 1977. Later, King was shocked to find out when he visited Gaines' grave. They shared the same exact same birthday, September 14th, 1949. Another band member who escaped death was Jojo Billingsley, who hadn't been with the band at the beginning of the Street Survivor tour. At the time, some people believed she was fired because she was having an affair with the very married Alan Collins. However, that was never confirmed, but she would later state in an interview, the night before the show in Greenville, Ronnie called to ask her to rejoin the tour. But fate stepped in, and JoJo would never make the flight because of a strange feeling she had while talking to Ronnie. An inner voice told her to wait, and she decided to skip the Greenville show and meet the band in Little Rock instead. Later that night, JoJo had a vivid dream of Leonard Skinner's chartered plane crashing. Spooked by her vision, the following day she called everyone on the flight list and left a message to warn them. Alan Collins called her back, and she told him about her haunting dream. He said to her, Joe, it's funny you mention that, because I was looking out the window yesterday, and I saw fire coming out of the wing. Alan tried to warn the band, but they boarded the flight anyway. The deadly curse continued to follow the band like a ghost. Less than two years after the plane crash, Steve and Cassie Gaines' mother was killed in an automobile accident near the cemetery where her children were buried. Tragedy would strike again when Alan Collins was on stage with his new band. After a performance in November 1981, Alan received a phone call telling him that his pregnant wife Kathy had started bleeding in a movie theater and was rushed to the local hospital where she died. Suddenly, the guitarist was a widow with two little girls to take care of. Alan soon slid into a downward spiral of drugs and alcohol and isolated himself from family and friends. His misfortune would continue, and on January 29, 1986, he crashed his new black Ford Thunderbird, claiming the life of his then-girlfriend, Deborah Watts, and left him paralyzed from the waist down, with limited use of his arms and hands. One year later, Leonard Skinner would reunite for a short six-week tour with fellow early members Ed King, Billy Powell, and Leon Wilkinson, along with Artemis Pyle, Leonard Skinner's drummer at the time of the plane crash, along with Ronnie's little brother, Johnny Van Zant, as the lead singer. 
The band kicked off their first show at the Concord Pavilion on September 23, 1987, to commemorate the 10-year anniversary of the tragic plane crash. Allen, who was charged with manslaughter for the death of his girlfriend, took a plea bargain for the 1986 car accident. As part of his sentence, he was required to address fans at every Leonard Skinner concert with an explanation of why he could not perform, citing the dangers of drinking and driving, as well as drugs and alcohol. Four years later, he would pass away on January 23, 1990, from chronic pneumonia at the age of 37, and was laid to rest next to his wife, Kathy, in Jacksonville, Florida. Tragedy would continue to stalk the band, and Leon would be found dead in his hotel room on July 27, 2001. The bassist who survived the plane crash passed away of natural causes at the age of 49, complicated by emphysema and chronic liver disease. But his untimely death put the band in a difficult position because of a previous agreement they had with Ronnie Van Zandt's widow, Judy, which stated at least three of Leonard Skinner's longtime members would have to be in attendance for the band to tour. They decided to continue to perform anyway, with replacement bassist Ian Evans taking Leon's longtime spot. On November 28, 2005, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame announced that Leonard Skinner would be inducted alongside Black Sabbath, Blondie, Miles Davis, and the Sex Pistols. The inductees honored included Ronnie Van Zant, Alan Collins, Gary Rossington, Ed King, Steve Gaines, Billy Powell, Leon Wilkinson, Bob Burns, and Artemis Pyle. No post-crash members of the band were inducted, nor were any of the honkettes. Just a few years later, keyboardist Billy Powell, on a break from his tour schedule, would die of a heart attack on January 28, 2009, at the age of 56. Fate would claim another bandmate when former drummer Robert Burns Jr. died in a car crash in Georgia on April 3, 2015. In 2017, Gary Rossington, along with the estates of the band members that perished in the group's 1977 plane crash, Ronnie Van Sant, along with Stephen Cassie Gaines, sued to stop production on Cleopatric Records and Artemis Pyle's biopic, Street Survivors, the true story of the Leonard Skinner plane crash. In the lawsuit obtained by Rolling Stone, Leonard Skinner argued that although Pyle was free to exploit his own personal life story for the film, the band believed the biopic violated a 1988 consent order that members, including Pyle, agreed to in regards to who controlled the Leonard Skinner copyright. However, in 2018, Artemis Pyle, after an appeal, would win the lawsuit against the band and was given the green light to release the film. Sadly, founding member Ed King, who is credited as the co-writer on the band's greatest hit, Sweet Home Alabama, died on August 22, 2018, at his home in Nashville of lung cancer. Today, only one original band member, Gary Rossington, is still alive as of 2019. But he doesn't need aches and pains to remind him of that fateful day, and claims the crash continues to haunt him. Gary told the Easy Reader every year on the anniversary of the crash, right around the evening time when it happened, time stands still for a moment, and it gets weird for him. He said his wife Dale leaves him alone with his thoughts to remember and grieve. Over the years, Gary's health issues have worsened to the point that he has to take a battery of nitroglycerin pills to stay alive, and doctors have urged him to get off the road. But still, the band plays on, and Leonard Skinner's legacy continues. Currently, they've added 21 more dates to their farewell tour, including Canada and Europe for 2019. A fight between guitarist Alan Collins's then-girlfriend and later wife, Kathy, 
inspired one of Leonard Skinner's most beloved songs with the haunting verse, If I leave here tomorrow, would you still remember me? Over the years, the story of Leonard Skinner has become a never-ending tale of strange premonitions and chilling coincidences. Ronnie Van Zant, gifted with second sight, his nickname growing up would foreshadow his death. His friends would always call him the Mississippi Kid, but later in interviews, when he was asked why, Ronnie would reply he had no idea. But of course, fate always knew. And in the end, the southern rock poet would lose his life in Mississippi when the band's plane crashed in 1977. In the last few moments of his life, Ronnie walked up the aisle of the plane one last time to say goodbye to his bandmates. Six months after his death, his widow Judy would have a vivid dream where she was visited by the spirit of her dead husband, Ronnie. She woke up in the middle of the night and felt his loving presence. He told his wife he had three things he wanted her to remember. The first was to take care of their daughter, Melody. The second was not to worry about Alan and Gary because they could take care of themselves. And the third, he wanted to let her know he was all right. Ronnie Van Zant. A simple man, gone but never forgotten. Death by Misadventure was produced by Cosmic Media and written by me, J.C. Nova. Our supernatural team of co-hosts includes the talented Eduardo Fahey in London, Tom Dre, our master numerologist and paranormal investigator in L.A., Paul Robinson, magi and musician in Marin, and myself, I'm a psychic astrologer and paranormal investigator in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This episode was recorded at Robin Sound Studios in Marin, California, and also at Union Recording Studio in West Hollywood, California. Kudos to sound engineers Paul Robinson and Noah Shanklin. A special thanks to audio producer Christopher Lang in Tucson, who brings each episode to life, and Paulina from Upper Planet in London. She's responsible for the super cool design of our official website. She's also the designer for one of our favorite true crime podcasts, Case File. Please like and follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash death by misadventure podcast. Each episode is available for download direct via our website at deathbymisadventure.co.uk and also at iTunes, Google Play, CastBox, Spotify, Podbean, TuneIn, Radio Public, and Stitcher. Last but not least, our podcast is hosted by Libsyn. I'm JC Nova, and this has been Death by Misadventure. Thanks for listening. If you're thinking about becoming a nurse, it's important for you to know not all nursing degrees are the same. Xavier University gives you the power of three. Choose from three start dates and three in-person learning sites to prepare as a holistic nurse, helping people improve health, wellness, and well-being. The 16-month accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Xavier, an exceptional degree that prepares exceptional nurses. Search Xavier ABSN.